Really? Yes. Okay, so um, today, uh, during today, initiative formerly known as a dev meeting, I want to talk about something that is like completely not connected to software development, which I believe is perfectly fine. Um, and this is something that I already touched in some of the earlier discussions, and it goes around the topic of kudos, uh, kudos system that we have at Lunar. Uh, but I want to start somewhere else. I want to start with uh, sharing some of the stuff that I know around how our motivation work and how, especially how rewards influence our motivation. So uh, let me start with kind of a question that I would expect that we would know the answer. How do you think do money, does money motiv motivate? Does money motivate us to do better job? And takers? To some point, yes. Yeah. I mean, it motivated me to some point. When I was like to some point, another ideas? No. <laughs> another idea that it doesn't it doesn't motivate us. So uh, <clears throat> so this is something that I that this is a pattern that I keep noticing throughout my career over and over and over again. That people when they are thinking about themselves, they tend to think that if I got more money, I would be doing a better job. And uh, Back then, I was challenging people, saying, "Okay, so let's assume that I can that, that I can afford to pay you twice as much. Would you do twice as much as well?" And obviously, this is kind of an argument ab, ad absurdum, because it's not easy to stretch yourself twice as much just like that. However, uh, right now, I have a much better answer, and that answer comes from at least two books. Both of them are highly recommended to go through. Uh, one of them, the left one, Drive, from Dan Pink, is somewhere here, maybe there. Uh, and basically, the answer is, just to keep the story short, money does not motivate. There are exceptions, and uh, one exception is that money can motivate to do a better job when the job is something mundane and something that does not require creative thinking it, and does not require finding new solutions. So like, I don't know, like sticking two pieces together all the time, all day long. For that, money can motivate. Uh, the other thing is that money in some situations can motivate in the short run. So for short periods, we can try more, we can do better, but in the long run, the motivation effect does not work. So here are the two experiments that I want to mention. If you go through those books, especially the Alfie Kohn's book, uh, Punished by Rewards, you would, you would go through lots and lots of experiments uh, because what Alfie Kohn does is he uh, mentions lots and lots of different research uh, run on the topic, but just we mentioned two of them. One is the experiment mentioned by uh, Dan Pink, uh, which is this. The participants were asked to uh, find a solution uh, having, I can, I can actually see that uh, clearly. So they, they had a box of tacks, a candle, and matches, and they were supposed to put, the, to use the stuff uh, in a way that the candle would be attached to a wall in a way that the wax wouldn't fall. And the solution is that you need to use the box of tax as, as a stand. It's not obvious because like on this picture, a box of, ta like a box of tax is basically a container for, for tax. Uh, so the solution requires kind of a creative thinking. Now, they, they were trying to motivate people by paying them uh, to solve that problem. And surprise, surprise, the more they paid, the worse the result. And the explanation is that setting a reward at the end of a task gives us a tunnel vision. So this means that we, we can be more efficient 
where we actually know exactly what to do. But if we don't know what to do, when, when, we, when we need to look wide and broad, actually setting a reward uh, not only does not motivate us to do better, but actually makes us do worse. So this is one thing. The other, the other experiment that I want to say is, comes from Alfie Combs' book. And what it shows is that money does not, on, that uh, money don't work not only in the context of motivating us, but it's actually harming us. So here's the thing. And this is again repeated by research after research after research. When we start giving rewards for something, it kills our intrinsic motivation to do that. And just to show you kind of an extreme example of that, there was, uh, there was a research run on, on kids. So uh, there, were, uh, there were three, three groups of kids. There was, uh, there was a reference group, and kids were given uh, crayons and, uh, and pencils to draw, like two different devices that they could use to draw. And the reference group were like just, let's, let, they, they let play, they let children play with the, with, 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 uh, the drawing tools. And obviously, you know, depending on preferences, kids basically used both of them like uh, equally uh, equally frequently. Now, then one group of kids were given a reward for picking crimes. The other one, the other group, was given a reward for choosing pencils. So what, ha what, what has happened? How do you think? Well, obviously, those kids who were given a reward for choosing crayons chose crayons. Those kids who were given a reward uh, for choosing pencils chose pencils. Now, what has happened when they stopped giving that reward? How do you think? They stopped going. They were much less interested in picking the tools that they were rewarded for uh, using in the earlier part of the experiment. In other words, what reward did was ensure a short-term compliance. We want you to use crayons, so I. I, so I use crayons, and, I, and then I get, I get a sweet. But in the long run, it killed children's intrinsic motivation to use the, that tool. And I mean, like, absolutely, crayons and pencils, there is, well, maybe for Gosha there is a difference. But for kids, there is no difference. Neither of them is better. And that observation was repeated over and over and over again throughout different research. It was repeated on children, on teenagers, on adults, in different contexts. Whenever we get paid for something, it results in killing our intrinsic motivation to do that. And while reward is gone, we stop doing that. Is it temporary or is it uh, constant throughout it, the time? It is, uh, uh, the effect lasts in the long run. So, so one thing is that if you want to raise your kids to be good people, you shouldn't reward them with anything tangible for being good people. Because then they would be behaving well only when they expect a reward. And when they know that there is no reward, they would stop doing that. And this is the way Alfie Kahn puts it. Uh, and the, the most important passage is marked in red. Reward, rewards. Exactly as punishments, the mechanism is identical for rewards and punishments, undermine the intrinsic motivation to do the right thing, whatever uh, experimenter would think is the right thing. And the follow-up to that, again, it's Alfie Kahn from Punished by Rewards, uh, using rewards for activities that we would expect people to do, like reading, writing, drawing, acting responsibly, uh, end up distinguishing, extinguishing motivation to do that. So as, as in the example when we were discussing Tomek's Tomek steak, in the short term, I get paid to wash the dishes, I wash the dishes. Then the reward is gone, 
my motivation to wash the dishes because I'm helping my family is gone as well. Now, there is also lots of research to show how harmful different kind of rewards can be. So obviously, the more tangible the reward, the more harmful it is. So if the reward is actually monetary, it is more harmful than pat in the back. However, both are harmful. And there is also the whole another dynamics of, uh, around the expectations of a reward. So what it seems that when we know that we, that we should expect a reward, that when we do this, we would get that, so the reward is expected, it's, it is much more harmful than when reward is unexpected. So we do something and then, oh wow, I got something for that. Nonetheless, even if the reward is unexpected, it is still harmful. And it's, when you think about it, it's, it's kind of obvious because, you know, one, once it happens that I get an unexpected reward, well, I, I couldn't have known. But then after some time it happens again. And then subconsciously I start thinking, oh, maybe this time I would get a reward as well. So even if the reward is unexpected and intangible, it is still harmful. So unexpected, expected reward is worse than unexpected reward and unexpected reward is worse than no reward at all. So what does it all have to do with our kudos? So what kudos is? Well, kudos has uh, like two different dynamics around it. So first of all, kudos, which we have just seen, is a show of appreciation. Someone did something and someone else thought it was valuable, they wanted to appreciate that person, they wanted to, they wanted to thank for that, and thus we write a kudos card. What's the difference between reward and public appreciation? Can I take questions at the end? Just, just keep it with you. The, uh, the other dynamics around our kudos system is that when someone receives a kudos, they also receive a right or an option to get a small gift or a kudos of kindness, which is an another option, but uh, most of us receives a small gift. Now, when you look at the small gift part, there is over the years, there was an evolution how this small gift part worked. So here is, here is history. I don't know the exact timeline, but basically this is how it looked like. So first, uh, the, the gift part was basically a silly thing that was taken from a box of silly things, silly use, useless things that were there bought by someone. Uh, so whenever you get kudos, you would go to the box, pick something that was uh, least embarrassing for you, and this would be your small gift. But then, like after the initial kind of freshness of getting random silly things at random, uh, <clears throat> we started having a problem with like what should be in the box. And then Mirek, who used to be refilling the box back then, started asking people what he should actually buy to put into the box. So people started sharing their ideas like, well, that would be, that sounds silly and fun. Uh, but then we started being, in a way, we started being tired with those silly useless things. So we started proposing things that were less silly and less useless. Uh, so it was like more like, well, does it really have to be silly? Maybe it can be actually useful. And then we started, at some point, we started basically ordering things that, that we would genuinely want to get if we get a kudos. And those things were sitting in a kudos box that at some point became a kudos shelf. But then we started things like, oh, actually, I picked something for my kudos, but someone else took it because they got kudos earlier. So then we started seeing dynamics that was actually ordering things not up front before we got kudos, but after we got kudos. So we got a kudos card, but actually we don't have to use it right now. 
So once I have a kudos card, I will order something for me, and then I will be sure that I will get that thing from the shelf. And then, and this is kind of a re recent thing, we started talking, you know, like, you know, like what, what actually I can get for kudos? I'll be like, because like the limit is 50 zloty, so can I have two cheap things for one kudos card? And can I have one bigger thing for two kudos cards? And these are the discussions that we've had here in this, in this room, so they couldn't be like extremely, extremely uh, long ago. So the whole evolution, and my, I may be oversimplifying here a little bit, is going toward the point where we are asking ourselves, what can kudos buy? How much this kudos, kudos that, I, that I just received is worth? And step after step after step, when we are looking at this evolution, the kudos card gets closer to closer to an equivalent of what I think may be a new design of the kudos card, which is this. It's a joke. Uh, Gosha, Gosha designs kudos cards so much better than that. The problem is that the way we think about kudos card subconsciously makes it look more and more like this than just a card with a thank you note that is a show of appreciation. So this is one part. This is one part that concerns me. There is another part. And this is part that, that would be peaked somewhere in, in between the conversations around random things out here. And I didn't hear it once. But I would hear that in a different situation. Oh, we'll get kudos for this. Which even if, is, if it is said like half jokingly, it is a sign of a specific way of thinking. So kudos and the reward for kudos started becoming, start, started being something that is somewhat expected. So it's not only a tangible reward that is connected to kudos, but also our sub subconsciously built expectation that we would get kudos for something. And I was, I was discussing uh, the thing with like random people at random occasions, and I don't want to, I, I want to, I don't want to put anyone in a limelight, but I can say for myself that as much as I do not like seeing that dynamics, I am guilty of those thoughts as, as well. What can kudos buy? Would I get kudos for this? And it's a kind of a shameful thought for, thought for me. That's not something that I would consciously choose to think, because it's completely unaligned in uh, b with what I believe in. Nonetheless, I do remember such thoughts on my end. So when I look at it, when I look at the outcome of the research, and I understand that tangible rewards are bad, that expected rewards are bad, what I see is that the kudos evolved from the bottom of this ladder toward the top. I don't say it's on the top. It's still, we still don't plan to get kudos. It's not, if I do this, then I would get kudos kind of thinking. But it's much closer to that than it used to be. And the more we treat kudos as a reward, an unexpected one, the more it heals intrinsic motivation to do whatever we are doing that makes others give us kudos. And this is the real problem for me. Because I don't, I don't really care that much about you know, like how much we're spending on the gifts or uh, like the money that we get, even if we're getting like really 50 slotted bill for each kudos, uh, it wouldn't be in most cases like an intangible, an intangible reward or money for anyone. What I do care about, though, is the dynamics, this harmful dynamics of rewards, that when we are getting rewards for something, it kills our intrinsic motivation to do that. And this is the part that I don't like about the current system. And I do not want to say that everyone 
is exactly the same. As always with research, it goes with statistical data. So I don't want to say that each and every of us works the same way. I don't say that for each and every of us, rewards are equally harmful. I do not say that for each and every single one of us, kudos drives this negative, unwanted effect that I, that I just described. What I say is that, statistically speaking, for our group, as all, as a whole, this is true. And this is why I have an idea. Actually, it's not mine, uh, because Hanya beat me to it. I want to drop the reward part from our kudos system. I want to keep it the way it is, with the fun that we have with, with Kudos Fest, with all the good stuff that we feel when we hear appreciation, but I want to remove the report part altogether. Actually, I think that the Jester's idea to, to uh, turn reward part only to Kudos of Kindness is equally good or better. Uh, but the main idea for me is to remove the gift part from the kudos system altogether. Thank you. <laughs>